separate Even if I run away Your love never fails I know I'll still make mistakes You have no mercy for me every day present Lord thank you God for your holy presence this morning as I come into your presence past the gates of grace into your sanctuary 
a standing face to face. I look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your grace. I can only bow down and say,
thank you, Lord, that you have cleansed us by your blood. By your blood alone, Lord God, thank you, Jesus. We enter your presence now, Lord, to give the glory and the honor to you, Lord, because you deserve it all. Thank you, Savior. us always 
even to the end of this age. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here this morning. God, that you're here with us, Lord, to receive your praise and glory. But you're here, Lord, to touch the needy. You're here, oh God, to restore and to heal and to deliver, to rescue. Lord God, we just ask that Christ Jesus, the Son of God, will be highly exalted in this place today. That your perfect, divine, eternal will will be accomplished. Help us, Lord, to just surrender, to submit, to listen, and to learn that we might grow. Lord, if there's anybody who needs a special touch from you today, God, I know you are faithful. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will touch and that you will heal and deliver right now in Jesus' name. God, open our hearts and open our minds to hear your word and help us to obey, Father. Jesus, we worship you. We praise your holy name, Lord God. Let your divine will be done, we pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father God, for your faithfulness. You may be seated. Thank you, brother. Um, we're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I'm going to uh, begin to read at verse 8, Ecclesiastes 4. I'll give you a second more to find it. It's a little, it's that small. It's a very thin little book. Chapter 4, verse 8. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labor? Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, For whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward of their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. The title of my message this morning is, You Need a Friend. You Need a Friend. These verses in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 continue the larger section that began in uh, chapter 3 at verse 16. Solomon is the writer here. Solomon is bewailing the vanity of all life. He's saying, if you look at Ecclesiastes, he's basically saying everything in life is empty. It's, it's just all vanity, vexation of spirit. What we're to understand from the book of Ecclesiastes is that Solomon had experienced pretty much all that life had to offer. If you read it, he, he, he had it all. He had success, he had power, he had riches, homes, lands, possessions, wives, children. He had everything. Um, in, uh, in today's measure, he had more cars than Jay Leno. <laughs> he had everything. He had, you know, hundreds of, or if not thousands of chariots. He had he had everything. In this segment, he observes that in this world of plenty, not everything goes well for everyone. We just heard it. Sometimes life is great, sometimes not so much. And uh, here he addresses the individual who is all alone. In verse 80, he's talking about one who goes out and who earns a living. And it's not about the money so much as it is about his life. This, this, uh, this person is pictured as someone who, who goes out and, and, and has a career, has a employment, and, and earns a living, and works hard. But, but to what end? There's no one. He comes home, and he comes home alone, and there's no one to share it with. And, and there seems to be no real purpose in this person's life. And Solomon is saying it, it's all vanity. It's, it's just empty. Listen, friends, um, this world can be a lonely place. I don't know if you've noticed that, but it certainly can be. Do you know that there are now some 8 billion people on planet Earth? 
Eight billion people. Now, you would think with that number, eight billion people, that would be an incredible opportunity for more friends. What do you mean you don't have a friend? There's eight billion people. If you can't find a friend in eight billion people, well, let me, not, <laughs> let me stop that line of reasoning there. But you see, with 8 billion people and all the opportunities to find a, a bunch of friends, we tend to complain about the traffic. <laughs> right? There's too many people. It's too congested. Rather than looking at the opportunity to make friends, we complain that there's too many people. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul writing to the churches of Galatia, he says, As we have therefore opportunity... Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. As we have opportunity to do good, let us do good. Friends, the opportunity presents itself daily. Eight billion people, did I say that? There's eight billion people. The opportunity to do good presents itself to us all day long, every day. He says, while we have opportunity, we have nothing but opportunity. Are you with me? Opportunity, both to reach the lost and to minister to the body of Christ. Now, the Word of God has so much to say about loving one another. If I looked at uh, all the verses on, on what God says, the, the, uh, the uh, Apostle John is called the Apostle of Love. Because if you look at what he said in John the Gospel, and if you look at what he said in his epistles, and, and, and then again, even in Revelation, there's no, there's no question in the Word of God our responsibility to love one another, right? There's, there's absolutely no excuse. The, the, listen, we should consider it a great spiritual deficiency if we do not have love in our hearts for one another. If we sense a, a lack of love, if we, don't, if we are not involved in loving one another, then we should consider that a deep, uh, serious uh, deficiency in our spiritual life, according to what Jesus said. Listen, this is the very beginning of our Christian witness. According to God's word, love is not optional. You with me? You don't have a choice. And if it's missing in your life, there's a problem there. It is our primary responsibility. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. Not by the size of the Bible you carry, or the cross around your neck, not the bumper sticker on your car. No, by this will all men know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. So this is our, this is primary, this is, this is the basic, this is the beginning of our Christian witness. So how about the person that is all alone? Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 8 refers to a lonely individual struggling through life seemingly without a person, a, a, a purpose. And there's no one to share, uh, no one to share with, no, no one to share life with. <laughs> You know when you're joyful, you have good news, you know, like the woman who lost the coin and, and want, swept the house and found it and wanted to tell everybody? When you have good news, you want the world to know, right? You, you post it on Facebook. <laughs> you, you put it out there for the world to see good news. You want to share that. And when you're sorrowful, when you're, when you're, when you're having difficult times, you, you don't want to be alone in times of difficulty. Here we have a picture of a person who is living their lives, they're working, they're earning, they're doing, but they're all alone. There's no one there to share the good times or the bad times. My friends, we all need a friend. We all need a friend. Firstly, we need a friend when we fall. You know, there are all these pagers for the elderly, uh, life call, life way, life this, life that. Um, I, uh, I bought my mother a jitterbug phone, a jitterbug with a big red button, you know, push the button and they're coming. So I bought her a jitterbug and, and she keeps it in her pocket and, uh, you know, great. So she, she puts it on the charger at night when she goes to bed. So Wednesday night she goes to bed, she puts the, fo the phone in the charger on the right side of the bed and she gets up to go to the bathroom around midnight and she fell. And she cracked three ribs. 
and she couldn't get up. She couldn't, she tried to crawl, she couldn't, and uh, she can't reach the phone. So she laid there all night long, slept on the floor um, until uh, my family discovered that, hey, she's not answering the phone and my brother-in-law, and anyway, the fire department came and opened the door and found her and um, she's in the hospital. She'll be leaving the hospital to go to a convalescent home tomorrow. She's, you know, she's relatively okay, but she fell and she was alone. Um, Alan's mother fell uh, a few weeks ago uh, alone. Um, you know, Bruce has fallen. People fall. Uh, listen, when, when you fall and you're all alone, that's not a good thing, right? That's, that's what the scripture is addressing here. Remember those commercials on television? You know, you still see them sometimes. Help, I've, I've fallen and I can't get up. And we've all laughed at the commercials. Don't be honest. You've laughed at those commercials because they're so ridiculously uh, acted. The acting is so poor. It's like that, you know, come on. The, the commercials are comical, but, but the concept is anything but funny. The, the concept is not funny at all. To fall for the elderly or for the handicapped, it's extremely dangerous and frightening. The concept of falling when you're all alone. And they all lay there all night or, or perhaps longer and, uh, and perhaps uh, with a worse outcome. They could fall and get injured and no one would know. The, the, Solomon says, woe to him that is alone when he falleth. This, when we think of falling, yes, we could trip, we could fall physically, but there are other ways to fall. There are other ways to trip up in life. There are other ways that we, that we are fallen. Uh, it could be, a, uh, it could be a, a, a physical thing, but it could also be a spiritual fall. When we, we backslide and we fall from fellowship and allow difficulties to come into our lives that cause us to fall spiritually or financially. There could be financial problems that bring us down or there could be emotional. Look, at we all the bottom falls out on all of us from time to time when emi emotionally we have fallen. Can I get a witness? Amen. And so this falling could be multifaceted. It's Psalm 142. This is, the, this is David before he was king. He, is, uh, he wrote Psalm 142. He's running for his life from King Saul. He's, we believe that he's in the cave of Adullam at this time. And in verse 4 of Psalm 142, David says, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. This is David. At this point in time, David is, um, he is, he has been a commander in the Israeli army. He has led victories. In fact, he's popular as a, as a war hero. In fact, that's one of the reasons Saul is jealous. Because jealous gets, Saul gets attributed to his thousands in victory, but David gets attributed uh, tens of thousands. And so Saul is jealous for him and is chasing him. So, Paul, David, is a, he's a victorious uh, war hero, but he's alone. Here he is in the cave of Adullam. There may be his faithful surrounding him, and, and, but, but he's all alone. And friends, there are, there are people all around us. There are 8 billion people. There are people all around us, but no one to be a friend. Sometimes with all the folks around your life, you're still lonely. You still feel alone. Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. You know the story. I'm not going to tell you anything today that you don't already know. But you know the story of the Good Samaritan. Here is a, he's a Jewish young man. He's, he's, I'm assuming he's young. He's traveling. He's on his way to uh, Jericho. And he is beaten by robbers. He's beaten. He's robbed. And he's left for dead. All alone on the road to Jericho. And there are two religious leaders. R religion came by. <laughs> One on one side of the street, perhaps one on the other. They, they cross over. They, they don't want to see. They don't want to know. People are walking by. 
He's on the road, a very popular road, and folks are coming by, but nobody wants to bother him. They don't want to get involved with this man lying there bleeding on the road. I would just plead ignorance. I don't see it. I, don't, I know nothing, uh, you know, uh, until the Samaritan comes by. And the story is, you know, the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along, and Jesus was making the point. That, that a good person, be they Samaritan or Jew or whatever else they are, it was the good one that stopped to help. He is, the, he is the true friend. He is the neighbor, as Jesus was referring to him. Somebody stopped to help this individual who was in need. And Jesus holds him up for all time and eternity as the good Samaritan. The Bible says here, Woe to them who are fallen, uh, when they are, uh, uh, they are alone when they're fallen. This world beats, beats us up, right? This world beats up so many people. And, and it seems that no one really seems to care. Have you ever been beaten up and you don't really find a friend? No one seems to care. They, 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 they don't seem to be aware of your situation. Friends, we can help as we have opportunity as we have opportunity. And this goes beyond finances. This, this goes beyond counseling. It goes beyond just lending a hand to somebody in need. This, friends, we could, we could help somebody the greatest possible way we could bring them to Jesus. We could find that one who's struggling. We could find that one who's alone. We could find that one who needs help. And we could, we could introduce them to Jesus Christ. Everyone needs a friend. Everyone needs a friend. You need a friend when you're, when you're cold. Now we often use this reference uh, to marriage. In fact, it's in some of my wedding ceremonies, talking about you know, two lying together, there is, there is warmth. But that's not the picture, that's not the, that's not the original meaning or the original intent here in, uh, in, in, in Ecclesiastes. In the culture of the day, we would look at it kind of strange these days, but in the culture of the day, um, people would travel, uh, preferably two by two, so there is safety. That's how Jesus sent out his, uh, his disciples, remember, two by two. And it wasn't safe to travel alone. So oftentimes two people would travel. And the desert nights could get quite cold. So they, the idea is to share the blanket. Two travelers would share a blanket for the body heat, to survive. It's, it's part of the culture of the day. And so there would be, uh, it would be common for people to share their blanket. I taught my son... Uh, when he was much younger, to build a snow shelter. You know, uh, if you're ever out in the, in the woods, if you're ever out hunting or camping or whatever else in the winter, and, you know, it, and um, you're, you're lost, uh, a lot of people die in, in those situations because they can't, they can't find shelter, they can't keep warm. But I taught him how to build a snow shelter. You know, you pack the snow and you, you dig it out and you, you, know, you block the wind and so forth. And have you ever done that? I'm sure you did it as a kid. You called it an igloo or a snow fort, whatever else. But it's a snow shelter. And if you build it right, there's, there's enough warmth in that place to keep one person from freezing to death. It, you could stay alive. And two people, it, it could get quite, uh, quite comfortable in, in, a, in a little snow shelter with, uh, with body heat from two people. Um, when I was in the army, I'm sorry I always uh, 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 refer to this, but there's a, there's a lot of preaching uh, material in my time in the army. But, uh, you know, on general issue day, when you, sh when you showed up for, uh, to get your stuff, to get your, your equipment, GI day, general issue, they gave you um, one, they gave you a sleeping bag or military nomenclature, uh, sleeping bag, one each, olive drab in color. That's, but you got, you got one sleeping bag, and you got one pistol belt, and you got one canteen, and you got one protective mask, and you got one of everything that you needed, except for when it came to shelter. Now, I don't know if they still do this in the military, but when I was in a uh, hundred years ago, you, got, you only got half. You got a shelter half. It was a piece of canvas with snaps on the top of it. And what am I going to do with a shelter half? 
absolutely nothing. But if you found, if you found a friend, of course, you had a friend, it was assigned to you, but it, you needed a partner. And when you snapped the two shelter halves together, you had a tent. You had shelter, but you needed a friend. You needed a partner in order to find a shelter to keep you warm. You need a friend. This, friend, this, this world is so often a very cold place. In 1974, there was a movie, uh, a, a short story that came out. It was by the Brigham Young uh, Association, but it was a good movie. It was, the content was good. Uh, it was called The Cipher in the Snow. Does anybody remember that? Cipher in the Snow. It was a story of a young boy. Um, it was a young teen. Um, Cliff Evans was his name, and his, his family was going through his, uh, a divorce. His parents were divorcing, and, and in the process, they were so self-absorbed with their own issue. They're absorbed with the, with the, uh, the divorce and what they get and, and all those things. And so they, uh, they weren't paying any attention to, to Cliff. And Cliff kind of fell under the radar. He, he fell under the radar at school. He wasn't doing really well. Nobody was really paying attention. Nobody really noticed. He, he, he didn't have any friends. He didn't have, and he fell under the radar basically in life. And he's getting off the school bus one day in the, in the middle of the winter, and he falls and, uh, into the snow, and he dies. They did an autopsy. There was no sickness. There was no disease. There was nothing. Um, what the coroner uh, concluded was that he died of loneliness. And this apparently is a true story. He died of loneliness. He, 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 nobody seemed to care. Nobody seemed to be aware of his life. And so uh, this movie, and he, he, it was called A Cipher in the Snow. Now the word cipher, I had to look it up. It means one that has no weight, worth, or influence. A non-entity. And so... So this, this young man, this young boy, in, in his own value system, in his own way of looking, he, was, he had no value, he had no purpose, there was no reason to live, and he just simply died of being alone. Friends, there are, there are many ciphers, if you will, out there. Many people that, no, they are not zero, no, they are not a non-entity, but they certainly feel that way. And there are many out there that are all alone. They, and we pass them by every day. Lonely and hurting and cold and afraid. And no one seems to care. We all need a friend. We all need a friend. We need a friend when we're under attack. Uh, David, in Psalm verse three, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Lord... How are they um, increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many. It seems that the enemy multiplies. When you start, when you start looking, Charles Greenaway used to say, when you count Philistines, they multiply. When you start counting devils, they multiply. When you start looking at the enemy, it seems that they multiply against us. We often come up, uh, we, we can't seem to keep up with the enemies that are surrounding us. I don't know, some of you may be able to relate, but there, there are times when, when there's a financial issue, and you're, you're dealing with the financial issue, and while you're dealing with that, sickness comes from the other side. And you get, you get whomped by, by sickness and illness, and, and, and your finances are out. And then, then relationships go south, and, and depression sets in. And it seems like you're getting beat up from every side. And you start looking, you know, who is my enemy? And then you start to say, who isn't? <laughs> and and where, where can I find a friend? The enemy surrounds us. In 2 Samuel chapter 10, David finds himself at war. And uh, the Syrians are joining forces against David. And in fact, if you read it, they, 
they, uh, the Syrians are hiring others. In other words, they're, they're calling others to, to jump on their bandwagon against Israel. And, and so they're, they're collecting enemies. <laughs> Have you ever been there? People start, um, they, they start going out f finding people to, to be enemies of yours. They start collecting enemies. I, 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 know what that's, I know a little bit of what that's like. And so the enemies are, are, are circling, they're, 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 uh, they're multiplying, and David calls for Joab. Joab is one of his mighty men. Joab is one of his generals. David calls for Joab. And when Joab saw the Syrians, when he saw the multitude that they were up against, he said, this is far too many for me. I, I can't handle this alone. And so Joab calls for his brother Abishai. And now... They, there's a, there's a, uh, a pact that Joab makes with his brother Abishai, and, and he says this, Look, brother, we're, we're really in this, and, um, and they're all around us. So here, I will go this way, and I will fight on this front. And you go this way, and you fight on that front. And, uh, and so uh, they determine that they will do this. And, and then Joab says, If the Syrians be too strong for me then thou shalt help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. Are you getting this? We're in this together, brother. We can't fight alone, so I'm with you. And if the enemy gets too strong for you, you can count on me. But I need to know that you're going to be here for me when the enemy gets too high, uh, hard for me. Listen, they needed the assurance of brotherhood or the assurance of friendship and and we each need the assurance of friendship everyone needs a friend everyone needs to know that someone has their six their back you need to know somebody has your back not a show that I watch or that I care to watch or that I suggest you watch but I've heard it so many times you know the theme song from friends um, the title of the show is Friends, and the theme song, you know what it is, I'll be there for you. I will be there for you. That's a friend. Everybody needs a friend. Listen, 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 6 uh, we find a story there. Jonathan. Jonathan is uh, the son of King Saul. Uh, a good personal friend of David's, but at this point in time, um, the, the Philistines are gathering against Israel. And Jonathan and his armor bearer go up against the Philistine camp. There's two men that go up against this camp of Philistines. There's hundreds there. And these two men go up together against the Philistines. And, and Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor, Come! And let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Hey, let's go together and we'll go up against this enemy. And, and God is not limited. He can save by many or he can save by few. But let's go together. Now they are severely outnumbered. Are you with me? They are severely outnumbered. And the armor bearer says to Jonathan, I am with thee according to thy heart. In other words, we're in this together. Or to bring it down where I'm from, I'm with you, bruh. I'm with you. Friends, we are exponentially stronger when we're, to not, when we're united. Exponentially stronger when we are together, when we are united. Everyone, everyone needs a friend. You need a friend when you need to be strong. The devil's strategy, uh, the enemy's strategy, has always been to divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Um, you just unwind the strongest rope. You know, have you ever seen these ropes that that hold ships at bay. I mean, there's got to be 
thousands or tens of thousands of windings on that rope and they hold these massive vessels that weigh you know thousands of tons and that rope is strong and but but you unravel the strongest rope down to its individual strands and they snap without any real pressure even the strongest rope when broken down is it, it loses its tinsel strength it loses its its strength friends the uh, individual thread snap one by one there uh, this world is so divided by everything by everything by identity politics no one you, no one is no one on television is known just because they're you know Joe Smith no, Joe Smith is either a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent. Joe Smith doesn't have a name. Joe Smith doesn't matter. Just what his political affiliation is. That's all we care about. It's, it's the, and, and so there's identity politics. There's liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, Independents. Gay, straight, transgender, white, black, racist. You're woke or you're a patriot or you're a Karen. Getting the point? Everybody's got a title. No one, no one just stands for who they are. No, everybody has a title assigned to them. You are something. And, and if you're something, then you're not something else. And somebody else is something else. And the whole world is divided, and especially in our nation. We are so divided over everything. We are witnessing the unwinding of our national identity. Not that I want to speak politically today, but my point is this. We are so isolated. People are so isolated. They don't know where, which camp they belong in. They don't know where to stand. They don't know who stands with them. Your, your neighbor could be, you know, in the other camp. And you can't count on... Your relative could be in one of those other camps. And, and so you can't count on them. And there's such division. And people just feel alone. We tend to wander away from the fold when we feel isolated or when we are alone. We tend to wander off on our own. Listen, we are taught independence these days. You know, years ago there was that song that was popular, learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. No, it is not. That has never worked. You're not supposed to hate yourself. I mean, love yourself just as much as you would love anybody else. You're a child of God. You're made in His image. But the, the greatest love of all is not loving yourself. That's inverted. That, and that's, the, that's, what we're, that's this mentality in our culture today. That's not God's plan. It has never worked. It's never been His plan. Listen, when I was growing up, I learned no man is an island. Right? We, you don't, we don't stand alone. United we stand, divided we fall. And if our backs should ever be against the wall, we'll be together. But that was the mentality then. Today, it is not. It's, it's, it's isolation. Listen, there is safety in numbers. None of us is smart enough or strong enough or gifted enough or talented enough to stand on our own to go it alone none of us we weren't made that way it's not God's intention that we be off on our own trying to make it through this life we need a friend we, we, we we're not strong enough to be out alone someone once said don't let your mind wander it's too small to be out alone <laughs> But alone, we're susceptible to danger. You know, it's the hungry wolf, or in our case, the lion that goeth about seeking whom he may devour. It's the hungry lion or the hungry wolf that circles the herd or circles the flock, looking for the one, the weakest, or the one that is the farthest away from the, the rest, the, the one that is isolated, the, the individual. And then uh, they attack it. They, they drive that one away, farther away from the herd where it, they're easy pickings. 
where, where they're isolated and, and when they're alone, there they're devoured easily. Hey, listen, Solomon says that a threefold cord is exponentially stronger. I don't know how that works scientifically. I looked it up just to see if it's true, and they say, you know, the internet, they never lie. Um, they say it's true. So that a three-fold cord is more than three times stronger uh, than three individuals. I'll, I'll, I'll go with it because the scriptures say that a three-fold cord is not easily broken. Three strands twisted together are more than three times as strong as three separate strands. When we stand together, we are stronger. And when we stand together with Jesus, we are invincible. We are invincible. I'm going to close. We were created by God as social beings. We're, we're created to be part of a community, to be part of a family, to be part of something. We're not created to be alone, isolated, and individuals. And so we're, we are created to be social beings. Now, some are, are more social than others. My kids laugh at me all the time because everybody in the world is my friend, at least initially. <laughs> then they get to know me and maybe not so much. but. But I, I, I love people. I, I strike up a conversation with everybody, anybody, about anything. I love people. I love to talk. Some folks, not, not so much. Some people are very isolated. Some people, some people are very uncomfortable with others. That's, 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 that's natural. That's, their, that's their, their te, uh, their, what I'm trying to say. That, that's how they're made up. But, but nonetheless... We are, we are called, listen, even, even those who are quiet doesn't mean that they do not need community. We all need community. We all need friends. We all need to belong to something. We are exhorted in Scripture to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And, and the writer of Hebrews, he says, and, and so much the more as that day approaches. As, as, and, and listen, these are the last days. The writer of Hebrews is talking about these days. As we get closer and closer to the coming of the Lord, things are going to get worse and worse. Are you with me? Yes. And so when things get worse, we're not to be... Don't take that as an opportunity to run and be isolated or to give up. That's the time when we need to find a community. That's when we need to find a friend. We need to know that we belong to something. Listen, there are so many around us in desperate need of a friend. I dare say you're in your family there are some. I say on your street there are some that are in desperate need of a friend. Maybe, maybe go a little bit further than just sh waving high at the mailbox. Maybe, maybe take some steps to, to befriend your neighbors. And listen, there are so many that are just desperate for a friend. So much more they could accomplish if they only had a friend. So much safer, so much warmer, so much stronger. Perhaps you're just that friend they need. My friend, what are you looking for? Maybe you're watching this, maybe you're seeing this on television or on Facebook or something else. What is it that you're looking for? Because I'll tell you, you have a friend at First Assembly of God. You have a friend here. You have a lot of friends here. You just need to meet them and, and, and know them. But you, you have a friend here. More importantly, you have a friend in Jesus Christ. You have a friend in God. Church, imagine what we could, what we could accomplish if we were truly together. If we were truly united in community. If we truly were like Joab and Abishai. Listen, I'm with you. If the battle gets too heavy for you, I'm there. But I need to know that if the battle gets too heavy for me, you'll show up. And my, we, we need to have that pact. Imagine what we could accomplish if we were truly that united. Say, I'm, this is my family. This is the body that God has sent me to. I belong. I belong. You belong here, friends. 
if our focus was on what God has assigned for us, and if we accepted his calling and purpose for us as a congregation, imagine what we can accomplish if we were truly, truly united in purpose. But I'm going to ask you as we close to, first of all, um, know that you belong here. And know that you have a friend here. And if you, are, if you are lonely or cold or weak or any other need, you look around. You've got brothers and sisters here. This is, we're here for you. Okay? We're here for one another. Let's make that. Can we make that pledge? Can we make that commitment? I am here for my brothers and sisters in this fellowship. And if you need, if, if you're all alone and you, you are lonely and you're afraid and you don't have a friend, then first of all, I would ask you, just, just ask the Lord to come into your life right now. He's a friend. The Bible says that sticketh closer than a brother. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be with you to the end of this age. But you could also find a friend here. Come here and find a friend. But let us be that friend. Amen? That let us be that good Samaritan that finds the individual who's alone and in need. And, um, and let's, let's make it our, our case. Let's make it our, uh, our responsibility. Amen? Uh, Lord, I just thank you for your word this morning. I, I pray, God, that something I said uh, finds its place in the hearts of your people. We're so grateful, Lord, that we have a friend in Jesus who never lets us down.